Well, I've been uh, in transhumanism for about as long as modern transhumanism has existed. There have been various precursors. It's hard to say exactly where things start. But uh, back in 1990, I wrote an essay called Transhumanism Toward a Futurist Philosophy. And people had used the word transhuman before, but in the modern sense, nobody really created a philosophy of transhumanism. So I was really the first person to do that and developed what we call the principles of extropy, which is a particular uh, transhumanist philosophy. And I've had a very long, long interest in life extension, um, started practicing life extension and being intellectually interested in the idea since well before I stopped growing. Um, in the early 90, uh, my early 20s, I started the first cryonics organization in England, and uh, I'm currently the president and CEO of the Alcohol Life Extension Foundation, which is the world's leading cryopreservation organization. The singularity to me seems to be a little bit too singular. It seems to assume that all these different technologies converge and take off all at the same pace, whereas in my view, we're more likely to see a surge which might tailor off, might slow down. In fact, it may be a series of surges. Uh, information technology may improve at a different rate than biological technology, than nanotechnology, and so on. I don't think these all are necessarily coordinated. Uh, I can see the argument for that. If everything is driven by superintelligence, then perhaps that drives everything else. But I think that rather ignores economic and organizational factors and consumer adoption factors and so on. So I tend to think that what we'll see is the same as we've seen historically, but speed it up, which is that certain technologies will take off at a very accelerated pace, and it looks like we're hitting a singularity, but then they may actually slow down for a while, and then they may take off again, typical S-curve, and there may be a whole series of these, rather than one singular event. I tend to think that the idea of a singularity is a little bit seductive, it's very appealing, and it has certain uh, historical, and religious, and mythical uh, reverberations that I think kind of attract people to that idea. But I think it may be a more complex picture than that. Well, by a surge, I'm really meaning that part of what's usually called the singularity, where we see a rapid increase in the growth rate of a technology, the kind of exponential growth. But it kind of includes the idea, if it's a surge, that implies that it doesn't last forever. Uh, and then it kind of gra gradually tails off, it flattens off. Whereas the singularity, if you look at the curves, they seem to be exponential and they, until they become vertical and you get an infinite rate of change in a finite amount of time. So the idea of a surge is that, yes, we do feel these sudden rushes forward, like with, for instance, uh, aerospace technology. We've got some very rapid advances uh, from the Wright brothers onwards. There was rapid changes. And now it's pretty much slowed down, uh, even though there was some continued progress in military aircraft. Still, we don't really see planes get any faster. We're not seeing Mach 20, Mach 50 planes, that's pretty much slowed down. So there you had a surge in the 20th century, and that's kind of uh, petered out now. The Omega Point idea, as uh, developed by Frank Tipler, the physicist, does build on uh, Teilhard de Chardin's idea of this idea of a uh, kind of intellectual realm driven by computing power, very much on, on the lines of the singularity view, that reaches an infinite state where essentially every atom of matter in the universe eventually becomes part of a thinking device. Uh, and in Tipler's particular view, that seems to become a single mind. Now, I don't know why, even if matter was replaced, in, well, it was converted entirely into thinking matter, I'm not sure why a single mind would be the result. But I think he's been driven again by the sort of Judeo-Christian tradition that, of a singular mind. And so in his view, we have almost infinite computing power, uh, and that could in principle resurrect everybody who ever lived by simulating all possible people who ever existed. And in his idea, they would come back into the simulated reality, which would be much like a heaven. So it seems very conveniently to fit the Judeo-Christian worldview. So I'm not sure it's going to happen that way at all. But I think in broad outlines, this general picture is kind of plausible, this idea that we will increasingly turn unthinking matter into thinking matter. And if you look long enough ahead, millions, billions, trillions of years into the future, it seems a fairly plausible picture of the general direction. The matter will essentially be turned into, into thinking matter, into consciousness. Um, not in any mystical sense, simply that we'll be using lots and lots of matter for computing, which means our minds can be vastly greater, vastly more powerful, uh, and the world will be unimaginably different. I think that people, when they look at the future, if they do accept this idea that there are going to be drastic changes and great advances, they will necessarily try to fit that very complex, impossible to really understand future into very familiar mental models because they want to put things in boxes, they want to feel like they have some kind of grip on that. So I won't be surprised to see you know, Christian transhumanists and Mormon transhumanists and even Buddhist transhumanists and every other group um, will have some kind of set of these ideas. They will gradually accept them, but they'll make their future world fit with their pre-existing views as to how it will be. Um, and I think that uh, 
the essence of transhumanism is not is not religious. It's really based on humanism. It's an extension of humanism, hence transhumanism. It's really based on the ideas of reason and progress and enlightenment, and a kind of a secularism. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's incompatible with trying to you know, make certain of the transhumanist ideas of self-improvement, of enhancement. I think those are potentially compatible with at least non-fundamentalist forms of religion. Back in, uh, I think, 1993, I wrote an essay called On Becoming Post-Human, and I wrote that for Free Inquiry magazine, which is probably the premier humanist publication in the United States, uh, the invitation of the editor. And that was a very interesting experience because he told me the response, first of all, it was a huge response. He got more letters responding to it than he had in any previous uh, article. And he said they're pretty evenly divided, 50-50, but half of them said, this is really fascinating. I'd like to know more about this. It sounds like a good idea. And the other half thought this is a terrible idea because it was challenging humanism. It was challenging the idea that we should just be you know, the best humans we can be because we're saying we can become something more than human. So those people sort of clung on to the, the current idea of the human, whereas I think the other half understood that we're really building on humanism. And there is this tradition that you know, humanism has the ideas of progress, of reason, of looking past all the artificial boundaries between us, the racial and gender boundaries and so on. Uh, it's all about improving everybody's condition. So I see transhumanism as a direct descendant of that, the Enlightenment humanist project of challenging every orthodox belief, challenging everything that we currently accept and saying, why can't we do better? And pushing that not just to improving society, just improving education, but asking fundamental questions. Why can't we improve human biology? Why can't we change our genome? Just because it's the way it is doesn't mean it's as good as it can be. Why do we age and die? Why can't we do something about that? So to me, transhumanism is the natural successor to humanism in a positive sense. People tend to make an apparently clear distinction between treating a disease or a dysfunction, if we're getting a cochlear implant or a new heart valve, on the one hand, and enhancement on the other. And a true enhancement would mean essentially becoming something better than you are or higher functioning, uh, perhaps better than any human being is. But that distinction is really pretty blurry the more you look at it. And I think really it's a matter of, uh, of habit and of what you're used to, because if you get a heart valve replacement, you're just getting back to a very familiar baseline, whereas a more radical enhancement is something new. However, I think what we'll see is that as these become available and tested and safe, that people will very quickly forget their objections. It'll be very much like, um, say, open heart surgery. When that was first introduced, most people, you know, wouldn't realize this now, but most people were horrified by the idea. I mean, not really surprisingly, if you think about it, we're talking about cutting your chest open and sticking our hands in there and moving things around and sewing things up. That actually is a fairly gruesome idea. But now we think, oh, okay, if I have to have it done, you know, I'm not looking forward to it, but everybody does it. I think if we have life extension technologies, if we have cognitive upgrades, people will very quickly realize the benefits and advantages of those, and their apparent in-principle objections will very quickly disappear. It's certainly true that we've always extended ourselves physically and cognitively. We've used external calculating device like the abacus you know, for a long time. Uh, we've used various kinds of uh, artificial teeth, actually, for, for many centuries. So, yeah, and stones, obviously, to increase our ability to cut and to stab and to, to build things. So, yes, we've extended the body and the mind for many, many years. I don't really call that transhuman. Um, I tend to reserve that term for something that really makes a fundamental change in the human condition. And by the human condition, if that's not to be arbitrary, I think it has to mean defined by our genes, because that's what separates us from other species. So if our genes then lead to a certain kind of brain development, a certain ability in the range of visual acuity, of auditory perception, uh, which are limited by the way our genes have built us, then when we start talking about directly altering those genes to give us abilities beyond that, uh, or implanting devices, or doing some of the re-engineering of the human body or brain that allows us to uh, have you know, perceptual and cognitive and emotional ranges beyond that of any human being, then we can talk about transhuman. So wearing eye contact lenses doesn't really make you transhuman, but it's, part of, it's all part of the same process of augmenting ourselves. Yeah, the Humanity Plus conference I talked about essential transhumanism, and the reason I chose that was that this was the first transhumanist conference in Asia, and it seemed to me many people may not have a clear idea of what transhumanism is. Uh, they'd heard many talks about various particular aspects, certain technologies, whether it's robotics or AI or biotechnology, but they may be wondering, well, how does this all fit together? What exactly is transhumanism? And since transhumanism, modern transhumanism started in, say, the late 80s onward, it's really flowered and grown and developed in all kinds of many different directions. And so it can be confusing to actually isolate what is the core of that. 
So I was trying to get to that. I was pointing out how certain ideas had been emphasized, perhaps overemphasized, and people were thinking that was transhumanism. But really the core of transhumanism is the idea of using reason, science, and technology by, by goodwill to overcome fundamental human limits, to live longer than we've ever lived, to become smarter, to become emotionally better than we've ever been. That is the core of it. All the other things are details. The particular technologies are not the essence of it. Uh, maybe we'll use nanotechnology, maybe we'll use some other method, maybe we'll use biotechnology. So it's good to have arguments about which technology is most effective and most promising, but that's not the core of what defines transhumanism. It's defined by its values of, of progress and reason and optimism and not challenging limits and by using, uh, you know, pursuing that relentlessly. That's really what transhumanism is, essentially. There are a certain number of objections that come up uh, frequently, especially when we talk about life extension. There are typical ones about, what about overpopulation? What about resources? Won't I become bored? Won't uh, dictators stay on for millions of years ruling their, their countries? Other people complain that uh, it's somehow unnatural uh, even though human nature has always been about modifying ourselves and changing ourselves. So the certain standard objections come up, and to me they're all based on a combination of fear and lack of imagination. Essentially what people usually do when they think about these, these distant scenarios, they tend to project how we are today into the future. So for one thing, you talk about life extension, bizarrely they automatically think that we're talking about living older and getting older and older and more and more decrepit and of course you would want to live like that. But we're not talking about that, we're talking about living youthfully and vigorously, in fact, better than we've ever been. Or well, they project other things remaining the same, not having any different technology, no better means of dealing with the environment. But the fact is that we've had environmental crises throughout human history. Back in the early Industrial Revolution, the British were burning all the forests to, for wood. But does that mean there are no trees left on the planet now? No, because we go through cycles, we learn new technologies, new ways of producing energy, and the same way we will respond to those challenges. So I think what transhumanists are pretty good at is thinking along multiple tracks. They can think about multiple changes at a time, not just one single change. That's not the way the world works. So almost all these objections are based on this false idea that one thing will change and nothing else will. Well, they just can't imagine other possibilities. They can't imagine new technologies changing the rules as they have always done and will continue to do so. One of the most attractive things about transhumanism, I think, is it's a very thoroughgoing philosophy of improvement. It's about self-improvement, it's about improving society, about improving the economy, about improving all our possibilities. So it's fundamentally a very progressive philosophy. Uh, you know, it's very popular, especially among young people, to make a big deal of being an anti-racist and anti-sexist. Transhumanists find that a little bit, bit of a yawner because, of course, that's very obvious. If we're talking about making radical alterations to ourselves, then you know, differences in skin color and gender seem pretty trivial by comparison. So uh, it's attractive because it really overcomes those rather artificial distinctions and looks well beyond them to what can we individually and as a species do to vastly improve our condition. So it has a, a real visionary component. It's not just about what are the problems of today and, and tomorrow and even the next five years. It looks far beyond that. So that has to be attractive. It's, it's uh, bringing back a vision into society that's been lacking for some time. I think we've become so focused on short-term problems and you know, complaining about how things are that we've lost a lot of that vision. Uh, you know, in the Enlightenment, that was a thing. They came out of the, the, the Dark Ages when nothing much good had happened for a thousand years. And so it was a very exciting view that, you know, with scientific method, we can actually improve life. And that's gotten a little bit forgotten in recent years. So transhumanism, I think, offers a new positive but you know, science and, and reality-based way of approaching an improved human future. I think there are multiple causes of short-term thinking. One of them is fundamental probably to the human constitution and something we'll have to overcome by making those fundamental changes, which is that our brains evolved to make short-term decisions. Uh, in the early days, for most of human history, we didn't live very long. We lived you know, 20, 30 years if you're lucky, and then you got killed by a, a tiger or you starved to death or you caught a disease or you fell off a cliff. So our brains evolved to make very short-term decisions. I'm facing a tiger, should I run this way or that way? Or should I duck down or run up a tree? Um, we didn't, they didn't have agriculture even, so they didn't even have to think really a year ahead. You looked about the next chase and finding a warm cave. So it was very, very short-term thinking, and that was how you survived. We now live in a very complex technological society with lots of inter interdependencies, and we live a lot longer than we did, and we can expect that to continue. So the brain is just fundamentally not well suited to long-term thinking, which is why I think we won't have fundamental solutions to these problems until we change the human constitution itself. 
On top of that, of course, you have all kinds of institutional imperatives. You have people who need to make short-term profits to satisfy their shareholders, and that tends to make us think short-term. You have politicians who want to get re-elected in two or three or four years, and so they, they think about maximizing the benefits uh, that they apparently produce in those few years, and it doesn't matter what the long-term consequences are. So they may be quite willing to hand out lots of money to people not thinking about the long-term debt they're producing. So these are some of the, I think, several factors that lead us to short-term thinking. So transhumanists are somewhat unique in uh, really stretching out that thinking horizon. How can we think several decades or even centuries ahead? Uh, and that takes, takes a lot of mental energy to do because you don't really know how things are going to work out. You can only look at general trajectories and trends. Uh, but by imagining those possibilities, of course, you, you create those possibilities. If you never think about the long term, you'll never really head in that direction. You'll just be bumped around by the current forces. I think the idea that technology causes dehumanization is actually the reverse of the truth. Now, certainly some technologies can be abused. I think people who you know, lock themselves in front of a screen and play the same video game for 18 hours every day, that may be dehumanizing them because it's narrowing, narrowing them down. It's narrowing their relationships, they don't interact with other people, and they don't have a wide range of activities. So you can abuse it. But in general, it seems to me that uh, if you're at the mercy of nature, um, if you're stuck in one particular environment, you can't meet anybody else, you become very insular in your tribe, and everybody else is seen as an enemy, uh, you become very narrow in your thinking. The long run of technological progress and of economic development means that we can afford to be generous, we can afford to treat people outside our immediate tribe as part of the same community. Uh, the level of violence has declined, as a number of recent books have been arguing. If you look at the actual trends, violence has massively declined over the last few centuries as we become wealthier and smarter and more civilized. Uh, so yes, somehow it's always the very latest technology that's dehumanizing. So I think, you know, in another 50 years, people will look at genetic engineering and, oh, no, that's fine, but there'll be some other technology that's dehumanizing. So it's really a matter of the unfamiliarity combined with the unfortunate tendency of science fiction, especially in movies, to always portray dystopias, these dehumanized futures, just because that's lazy and easy to portray. It's much harder to portray a future where technology has mostly beneficial effects. It's much easier to show producing these robotic cyborgs that will go around trying to kill the rest of humanity. So unfortunately, you know, that, that feeds that kind of view of dehumanization of technology. In Europe and in America both, especially in Europe, uh, a lot of technology and environmental decisions have been based either explicitly or implicitly on something called the precautionary principle, which essentially says that you should not employ any new technology, you shouldn't allow any new technology, unless you can prove that it'd be completely safe beforehand. There are versions of it, but that's the basic idea. Whereas one person summed it up quite nicely, don't ever do anything for the first time. Which is, of course, an absurd principle and impossible to actually act on. We can't guarantee that any technology will have no bad effects. In fact, you can guarantee they probably will, because we can't foresee everything. So if you try to act on this very cautious principle, what you do is end up preventing any kind of progress. And that itself causes great harm. That's what I call the paradox of the precautionary principle. By being cautious, you end up causing more harm than if you didn't, wouldn't be so cautious. So I developed uh, something called the proactionary principle, which is a much more balanced decision-making principle. It takes into account a lot more effects. It requires you to think very comprehensively, to use the best knowledge we have of decision-making, of probability, of risk analysis. Uh, it's really a set of 10 principles all brought together to encourage optimal decisions about uh, technology in the environment. So it's much more progress friendly. The idea is to, is to recognize the value of progress uh, and to take proactive measures to, to progress while also thinking of the possible downsides, planning ahead and minimizing those problems because you can't fully eliminate them. And it's really based on the idea that you cannot understand the best decisions to make until you start taking actions. So you may start small with experimental steps but you can't wait until you know everything about the outcome because you'll never know the outcomes unless you start actually taking action. You have to learn by doing. Cryonics is essentially the practice of, at the point of legal or clinical death, which is not the same as biological information death, preserving somebody and taking them down to a very low temperature and minimizing freezing damage, with the idea being that our current criteria for death is historically transitory. Just as people died 50 years ago, but now we could bring them back with better technology, in the future, people who died today of cancer or heart disease or aging itself could be revived. So what we do is we preserve people in an unchanging state uh, so that they can go to a future time where we have much more advanced medical technology and they can have a second chance.
This appeals to people who enjoy living and don't see any reason why they should give up on it just because their heart gives out or cancer decides to kill them or aging gets them. That's a very arbitrary thing. They want to choose how long they live. So the idea is they will come back, not as an old person, not as somebody with that disease, but as someone rejuvenated and at the peak of fitness that they've ever enjoyed. So why wouldn't they want to come back? Uh, as long as you enjoy living, it seems like you want more of it. And if you can be back in a healthy young body, but with the wisdom of the age you've accumulated, you've got a pretty good advantage there for a second life.